Hi again. We're doing part three of The Rise of Adventism, edited by Edwin Scott Gausted. This particular section is written by Winthrop Hudson, both of them famous church historians. In the prior segments, we've dealt with the Jacksonian influence of Andrew Jackson, who became president at the end of the 1820s, brought a different spirit to the American psyche. And uh, Charles Finney, the first revivalist evangelist to become exceedingly popular in that era, brought a different kind of evangelism and a different kind of emphasis to evangelism in the 1830s and 40s. What else was happening in the 1830s and 40s? Gaustad and Hudson, or Winthrop Hudson specifically, say this, if one effect of the stress on the primacy of individual religious experience in popular religion was to be a source of division within denominations, a simultaneous effect was to minimize the importance of denominational distinctions. Churches of different denominations joined forces and pooled resources to promote revivals and were not unduly disturbed to have converts unite almost indiscriminately with the church of their own individual preference and choice. Some of the more exuberant, however, whose enthusiasm was not easily contained within existing churches, formed new denominations that were more to their taste. Free will Baptists imported into upstate New York from New England, and both Wesleyan Methodists and Free Methodists of local genesis. Others who stressed the primacy of religious experience had early become completely impatient with denominational divisions and had sought to draw all Christians together into single fellowships. Wherever they were, in the lower Ohio Valley with Barton Stone, in the upper Ohio Valley with Alexander Campbell, in Virginia with James O'Kelly, in Vermont with Abner Jones, they preferred to be known by no other name than Christian. Campbell thought disciple of Christ an acceptable alternative. Some Christians were exported from New England into upstate New York, but the indigenous manifestation of this unitive concern tended to be somewhat atypical. Less troubled by ideological justification than was true elsewhere, the unity-minded among York staters, for the most part, proceeded in a simple, direct, matter-of-fact way to form what they called union churches. Ecclesiastical proliferation was furthered by dissent from an opposite quarter. Universalism flourished in upstate New York among simple folk who were repelled by revivalist assumptions and rhetoric in the hard-driving quest for the salvation of souls. In their reaction to the revivalist distinction between the damned and the saved, they opted for a doctrine of universal salvation. The most striking facet of the religious ferment of the 1830s and 1840s in upstate New York lay outside the bounds of conventional religion. The American environment in general was unusually hospitable to innovation, religious experimentation being encouraged by lack of legal inhibition, by absence of any unified ecclesiastical tradition, by a strong sense of the present being pregnant with possibility, and by sufficient space to provide opportunities to put into practice and institutionalize novel and even eccentric religious beliefs. In addition to this general context, characteristic of the nation as a whole, the intensity of the revivals in upstate New York when combined with tensions engendered by a mixed population with intermingling and conflicting patterns of life, created a perpetual excitement which was particularly conducive to deviant religious speculation and experimentation. Moreover, while revivals provided comforting reassurance to many, others were left distraught and torn by anxiety. Having struggled without success to resolve their anxieties, They were in a receptive mood to listen to new prophets and prophetesses who offered a promise of spiritual security. The emotionally disturbed, which revivalism left in its wake, explains how novel sects, cults, and communities once established could garner recruits. But it does not account for their origin. At the point of origin, ideas and attitudes fostered by the revivals played the creative role. Three emphases of revivalist preaching would seem to have been of decisive importance in forming the climate of enthusiasm out of which groups deviating from the norm of conventional popular religion 
emerged. First, there was a demand for immediate confrontation with God, which often took the form of an ecstatic vision or mystical illumination. This could easily be interpreted as a fresh revelation. Second, there was an increasing stress among the camp followers of the Methodists, associated with Finney, upon the possibility of perfect sanctification. Here the tendency was to arouse intense hunger for holiness and a life free from sin. Third, there was an emphasis upon millennial expectations, whether the millennium was thought to be inaugurated by the return of Christ or to be established by widespread conversions in anticipation of his return. All the groups and movements which lay outside the bounds of the conventional religion of the churches had their point of origin in at least one of these emphases, which, which mo with most representing a blending of all three, the conviction of being recipients of new revelation, the belief that they had found the secret of true holiness, and the consciousness of being participants in the fruition of ancient millennial hopes. Two women, Jemima Wilkinson and Ann Lee, both former Quakers, were the forerunners of New Revelation in upstate New York. In 1776, at the age of 24, Jemima Wilkinson had been expelled by the Quakers because of her involvement with some New Light Baptists, whereupon she was informed in a vision that a new spirit had taken possession of her body and that she had been reborn as the public universal friend, those words capitalized, as a kind of female John the Baptist, summoning people to repentance, she itinerated on horseback for ten years through southern New England and Pennsylvania, accompanied by a small cavalcade of devoted women adherents and winning small clusters of converts. In 1787, an advance guard was dispatched into the wilderness to secure land for a new Zion, considering first a site on Cayuga Lake, then establishing briefly a settlement on Seneca Lake, and finally choosing a hill above Cayuca Lake as the permanent location. There in Jerusalem, the universal friend held court, practicing a modified communism, stressing the virtues of celibacy and the equality of the sexes, and holding fast to a vision of universal peace. Active evangelism ended with her death in 1819, but a semblance of organization persisted until 1863. The story of Anne Lee and the Shakers is more familiar, and the Shakers were better situated for expansion than the community of the public universal friend. Jemima Wilkinson's Jerusalem was hemmed in and isolated from major lines of communication by the Finger Lakes. Shaker activity, in contrast, was centered at the mother community in New Lebanon, New York, near the Massachusetts border, and abreast the highway west from Boston through Pittsfield to Albany and beyond. Thus the Shakers were strategically located to contact and win recruits from among those left anxious and distraught by successive revivals in Hill Country, New England and upstate New York, the largest number of converts being drawn from free will, that is, New Light Baptist organizations or congregations. A major coup occurred in 1805 when emissaries were sent west to reap a harvest in the wake of the Great Kentucky Revival. The harvest included two of the most prominent leaders of the New Light Presbyterian schismatics and members of their congregations. By 1825, there were at least 20 Shaker communities scattered throughout New England, New York, Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. Mother Ann Lee's experience had been much the same as Jemima Wilkinson's. She had been converted in England as a result of contact with a small group of Shaking Quakers a group that in America would be described as New Light or Revivalist Quakers. Her, converse, her conversion was followed by a series of trances and visions in which it was revealed to her that the root and foundation of human depravity and the source of all evil was sexual intercourse. This was the original sin of Adam and Eve. A Shaker hymn put the point succinctly. As lust conceived by the fall hath more or less infected all, so we believe tis only this that keepeth souls from perfect bliss. Anne succeeded in summoning a little company of adherents to a celibate life, brought them, in, the, brought them across the Atlantic, and in 1776 established an informal community 
of eight followers near Albany. Her first American converts date from 1779, when a revival of New Lebanon proved so disturbing that it brought Joseph Meacham, a local Free Will Baptist preacher, and several members of his congregation into the fold. Henceforth, New Lebanon was the Shaker headquarters. This informal community, blending new revelation with perfectionist and millennial ideas, was not formally constituted as the United Society of Believers in Christ's Second Appearing until 1787, three years after Mother Anne's death. This was when Joseph Meacham, the former Free Will Baptist preacher, took charge, imposed a strict communist regime, and gave the United Society its definitive shape. During the final four years of her life, Mother Anne was reported to have performed miracles which convinced her followers that she was Christ at his second appearing, making manifest the female element in the Godhead, and inaugurating the beginning of the millennium by gathering a faithful remnant out of the churches of Antichrist. Next time, more perfectionist communities and the beginning of Mormonism. I'll put a link in to uh, an analysis of the the popularity of the goddess worship, the goddess Isis specifically in the Roman Empire. Even though Isis was not a Roman deity, she was embraced as the goddess, the supreme goddess by the Roman Empire. What was the essence of Isis, Isis's popularity? That video addresses the, the issue of why goddess worship took hold not just on the Roman Empire, but in, indeed the entire world.